Hello, everybody, and welcome to Clackamas United Church of Christ and to the Pastor Adam Facebook page. This is one question with Pastor Adam, and uh, welcome to the show, everybody. We've got uh, we've got a lot of talk about today, and uh, we're going to talk about the Supreme Court and uh, recent decisions. Um, but first, this is one question with Pastor Adam. And uh, we are here every Thursday, about every Thursday at 11 o'clock Pacific time to go over uh, one question or sometimes a couple of questions uh, that we have that are that you've sent to me over Facebook or Instagram or on social media and uh, questions that are just kind of in the air of our culture. and. Uh, Today, we're going to talk about the Supreme Court uh, and recent decisions that it has made, primarily about uh, abortion and uh, religion and the in the public square. And uh, I thought that I might just come on by myself and talk with you about this. And then I was like, no, this is way over my head. <laughs> I can't do this. So I need to bring someone on who can talk with us, who knows about this uh, these rulings and the history of them, because you may be like me, and you're uh, you're a lay person, and it's always good to talk with somebody about these big issues who has studied them uh, almost for a lifetime, <laughs> actually for a lifetime, and uh, nobody else that I would rather talk to about these big topics uh, than a friend of mine, a member of the church at Clackamas United Church of Christ the Reverend Charlie Hinkle. Charlie is going to come at this from different, uh, kind of different perspectives. Uh, Charlie is, is a uh, retired uh, lawyer here in the Portland area and has extensive experience in many aspects of the law, including constitutional and civil rights laws. Charlie was selected by his peers for inclusion in Best Lawyers in America. <laughs> Charlie's... Charlie's a big deal for me, uh, and uh, he's he's just so good at talking about these things. He was the first lawyer listed in Best Lawyers in America in the First Amendment category and was lead counsel in many landmark decisions construing the Oregon Constitution in the areas of religious liberty, open courts, commercial speech, election law, and property rights. Charlie is one of the most active and prominent cooperating attorneys for the ACLU. And uh, Charlie, Charlie has taught constitutional law and First Amendment courses uh, at universities and colleges, uh, Lewis and Clark College uh, School of Law uh, for many years. He's a frequent speaker. Charlie is also uh, a graduate and earned his MDiv. He's a Rev. He earned his MDiv from Union Theological Seminary. And so Charlie is, I wanted to talk with Charlie about the law and also about his faith perspective, how faith informs where he is coming from uh, when it comes to these recent decisions about abortion and also uh, uh, prayer, uh, religion in the public sphere, uh, specifically the decision about uh, praying uh, in public schools, uh, on football fields and things that you've heard about. So, uh, we will, uh, Luke, we'll probably also talk about, um, how we're feeling about the Supreme court. Has it lost its legitimacy? What can we do about this? Uh, and so we'll, we'll talk about all the things. So I'm going to bring, I'm going to bring Charlie in now. So here comes Charlie, uh, Amber, it's good to see you too. So hi, Charlie. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you. Thank you for being here. Uh, as I said in the intro, I was like, who am I going to talk to about this? And you were the first person that came to mind. So thank you for being here. It's always uh, it's always good to talk with you about these things. You've spent a lifetime on these topics. So uh, I'm excited uh, to talk with you about them. Uh, well, I'm always willing to talk about <laughs> <laughs> constitutional law issues. Uh, so uh, I, I'm, I'm happy to be here with you. Awesome. Thank you. And uh, friends, if you have comments, questions, uh, you can put those in the chat section. Uh, Luke already has one, Charlie. We might be able to get to this later. Uh, we should abolish the Supreme Court. <laughs> <laughs> Luke is Luke is a radical. So we'll, we may get to that. I mean, there is a lot of talk about the Supreme Court losing its uh, legitimacy. Uh, 
uh, and uh, maybe all of our institutions are losing its legitimacy in one way or another. But first, I want to talk about uh, Charlie, kind of like if you could give us kind of a primer of uh, Roe versus Wade, abortion in the United States. Uh, we take these topics one at a time, I think would be the best way to do it. So let's start off with uh, Roe versus Wade. Abortion. I read an interesting uh, statistic just this week, because of course the papers have been full of, the, of uh, talk about abortion in the last week or 10 days. Uh, and this, uh, the statistic that has been in many of the papers it can't, comes from the Guttmacher Institute, which studies reproductive issues and so forth. And they reported last week that one in every four women in America will have an abortion by the time they are 45 years old, one in every four. And that means that every one of us knows someone or knows someone who knows someone who has had an abortion. And thus it has always been. Abortion is not something new. It's been around for a long time. It's uh, for, uh, forever, I'm sure. Um, it has been a crime in most states throughout most of American history. The Oregon territorial legislature made it a crime even, even before Oregon became a state. But it wasn't a, um, it wasn't a law that was enforced uh, uh, very rigorously in Oregon or, or in many other states for that matter, unless there was a, a, a death of a, of a mother uh, that got involved. But most, most abortions were uh, were safe and uh, uh, and were, were and were carried out sort of under the radar. You know, you didn't talk about it much, but you also let it happen because it wasn't just something that happened to that horrible woman down the street. It was what happened to your sister, your aunt, your cousin. Uh, it, it happened to every family, and it continues to happen in every family. So it went along under the radar for quite a while in Oregon until a woman named Dorothy McCullough Lee became mayor of Portland uh, right after or soon after World War II. And she had run on a platform of cleaning up Portland because there was too much vice in Portland. And one of the vices that she was particularly exercised about, aside from gay bars, which was her favorite uh, target, but abortion was uh, ranked right up there. And, and she persuaded the Mullum County DA to start bring, bringing prosecutions. And there was a, a doctor, and there may be people listening who are of my vintage and who will remember Dr. Buck. Everybody in high school in Oregon in the 1950s knew, had a friend who had a friend who knew somebody who could get in touch with Dr. Buck. And he was a medical, he was a medical doctor uh, and he performed quite openly uh, abortions. Mm -hmm. The uh, Mayor Lee didn't like that, and she uh, went after him both criminally and through um, the Board of Medical Examiners to have his license taken away. And his license was taken away in the early, early 50s. Um, he continued to practice his uh, hobby. Uh, but under the radar even more so. He, uh, Dr. George Buck was his name. He and Ruth Barnett were the two prominent abortion practitioners. Ruth Barnett said that she had performed over 40,000 abortions in Oregon uh, from the 1920s on up through the 1960s. Finally, um, people who shared Mayor Lee's view of this took after her criminally also. And the Oregon Supreme Court decided three cases involving her. She was prosecuted in Clackamas County once and in Multnomah County twice in the 60s. And the Oregon Supreme Court decided all three cases. She, they decided in her, against her twice. But in one case, they ruled in her favor on the ground that her lawyer should have been allowed to question uh, members of the jury about their religious faith and about what their church or other religious institution, whatever it might have been, what their official position was with respect to abortion, because that would make a difference. Are you, do you have a truly neutral member of the jury, or do you have someone who comes in with a predisposition one way or another because of their religious faith? 
Mm-hmm. And the Oregon Supreme Court said, as we all know, there is a variety of religious opinion on this topic. Lots of people would like you to think that there isn't, but there is. Um, my denomination that I share with you, Adam, the United Church of Christ, just last week reaffirmed its commitment that it's had for 50 years at least, uh, affirming the right of bodily autonomy, affirming the right of personal choice in matters of, uh, of personal medical treatment, including the right to bear a child or to terminate a pregnancy. So our, our denomination stands four square behind the right of a woman or, or any pregnant person to choose uh, to terminate a pregnancy. Now, let me link that to what the U.S. Supreme Court has been doing then. About that same time, that is the 1960s, people began to challenge these laws in in court. But the first major challenge was to a Connecticut statute that prohibited the use of contraceptives by married couples. Didn't say anything about abortion. But can you believe that? A state, the state of Connecticut felt in the 1960s that it had the right to regulate the conduct of a married couple in their sexual union, in their bed, in their bedrooms. And so it was a crime in Connecticut for a married couple to buy contraceptives. The ACLU decided to bring a test case to challenge that, and it got to the U.S. Supreme Court in in 1965 in a case called Griswold v. Connecticut. And this case became the landmark bedrock uh, decision of uh, all the subsequent cases involving a right of privacy. And the Supreme Court said, in that case, uh, almost um, casually, I mean, you know, it said it's kind of hard to take this law seriously, this monumentally stupid, silly law. Uh, and we hereby hold that it violates the federal constitution. Now, there's no right of privacy mentioned in the federal constitution, but the court said there are enough analogies, enough uh, rights listed, many of them centered on the Fourth Amendment, which prohibits unreasonable searches and seizures, which is, after all, a right of privacy. The police can't come into your home to search you. And they said that, and plus this, that, and the other, add up to a constitutional right of privacy. That was 1965. Now that there is a constitutional right of privacy, Proponents, or yes, proponents of abortion thought, well, let's see if we, if that applies to abortion as well. And in 1973, the Supreme Court said, yes, it did. This right of privacy that we have said has constitutional foundations protects a pregnant person's right to choose whether or not to carry a pregnancy to term or to terminate it. That was 1973, and that's been the law of the land ever since until last week. Uh, And the Supreme Court has reaffirmed it several times. It has shaded it. It has limited it. It has put this, that, and the other kind of um, uh, interpretation on it. But that fundamental right of a person to choose whether or not to terminate a pregnancy has been in the Constitution since 1973. Clarence Thomas has never liked that decision. I want to read something that Hillary Clinton said last week, this week, actually. She said, Thomas is a person motivated by resentment, grievance, and anger. She knows Clarence Thomas very well. She went to law school with him. He was a couple of years behind me in law school, in fact. And he, he was a man then of grievance, resentment, and anger, and it has spilled over time and time again. And he's been fighting to overturn Roe v. Wade for as long as he's been on the court. And he finally, with the help of the indispensable help of Donald Trump, who appointed three far right-wing justices to the court, um, he got his way. And in the, 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 many of the papers have said the decision last week was six to three, but in fact, it was five to four on the question of overruling Roe v. Wade. It was uh, uh, Justice Thomas leading the charge, Justice Alito, uh, who was the one and only appointee of George W. Bush, George the Junior uh, Bush, and then the three Trump appointees. 
Um, those were the five who voted to overrule Roe v. Wade. They said, well, they, they, it, it, it is an opinion full of grievance, resentment, and anger. How dare the court have ever recognized this? This has no basis in the Constitution. You know, sweeping aside the fact that not just the judges in 1973, but at least a dozen members of the, of the Supreme Court since then have voted to reaffirm that, that decision. Uh, so that's, that's where we stand. Now, there, what are the ramifications of that? Well, the majority opinion by Justice um, Alito said, oh, don't worry about these other rights, the right of uh, same-sex marriage or the right of uh, uh, protection of, of, of same-sex sexual intimacy uh, or the right to have a contraceptive. These things are not an issue. But Justice Clarence Thomas wrote a separate opinion saying, oh, yes, they are. Those decisions, too, were preposterous and wrong, and I think we should go after them as well. So it is entirely possible. I mean, that, that was just an invitation from Clarence Thomas in the same way he'd been inviting people over these past two decades to bring another abortion case. He's now inviting people to bring another case challenging the, the right to marriage or the right to same-sex consensual conduct. Uh, he wants to challenge those decisions as well. One other aspect before we turn to something else, th this has direct First Amendment implications because as it stands right now, about half the states allow abortion and half will prohibit it. And the question with well, the First Amendment question is, can an Oregon uh, abortion provider put an ad in the Boise, Idaho newspaper saying, call us, here's our number, we're right over the border, come over to Oregon and we will provide you with, uh, with an abortion, no questions asked. Now back again in the 70s, some states had laws that prohibited that. You cannot advertise in our state, we prohibit abortion and therefore you cannot advertise within our state that there are abortions available anywhere else. The U.S. Supreme Court uh, held that that statute was unconstitutional in a case called Bigelow against Virginia. But there, the two conservatives on the court back then, Rehnquist and White, dissented. Mm -hmm. And I have no doubt yeah. that Clarence Thomas, if he can get his hot little hands on this, would also be willing to say the First Amendment does not protect an advertisement for abortion providers in another state. Many national corporations, including Nike and a lot of others, Amazon, are now providing transportation costs, medical costs for their employees who need to travel to another state. And there are groups that are formed in every state where abortion is allowed to facilitate that interstate travel. Oregon has an excellent um, agency here uh, in the state, uh, and we should put up a link to their website. Um, and the state of Oregon has itself put a million dollars into that. And just today, the Trailblazers said they were putting twenty-five thousand dollars into mm -hmm. it as well mm -hmm. to uh, to fund transportation and uh, lodging costs for women in other states who want to come to Oregon or other similar states. Uh, to have to have an abortion. So the abortion decision last week was uh, was a disaster for women, for family life in this country, but it also is a very dark omen for where the court is going to go next because those Trump appointees are all young. Mm -hmm. They're all going to be a court, on the court a long time. And I just hope all those people who felt that in 19 in, that in 2016 it made no difference whether we elected Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. Yep. I hope they're happy. <clears throat> because if Hillary Clinton had been elected, there would be a six to three majority on the court right now for Roe v. Wade and for gay rights yep. and for same-sex marriage. Now, thanks to Donald Trump and all those Hillary haters, the balance is the other way. And it's uh, we are in for a very rocky road in the next couple of decades. 
I've heard people say that the solution is that uh, Congress needs to, uh, we need to vote blue and get people in Congress so that they can pass a law. But I'm, I'm afraid that it's going to go the other way. I mean, what are, how, what are your thoughts? I see you shaking your head. So what are your thoughts? <laughs> well, the framers of the Constitution created the U.S. Senate with representatives, with two senators from each state. And that means the right-wing conservative majority that has a hammerlock on all the states from Montana to Alabama mm -hmm. have enough people to block any kind of constitutional amendment. They have the right, uh, the the numbers there to uh, to filibuster any 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 law. And now, the, uh, Joe Biden suddenly today, for the first time in his life, has said he favors abolishing the filibuster, but. You know there are, but that's not going to happen as long as Joe Manchin is in the yeah, is, nah. is in is in the Senate. So I I don't think that's a realistic possibility. I, I laughed early sometime last week. We got a mailer saying, "Help us amend the Constitution to overturn Citizens United." That's the case that gave corporations the right to spend unlimited amounts of money. Well, you can't amend the Constitution without three quarters of the states, and there are. A quarter of the states plus one, that's all they need to block any kind of liberal amendment to the Constitution. So, yeah, I, I, that's magical thinking. Yeah. I think that we're going to uh, get a legislative fix for this. What, hey, do we, um, what is the fix for this then? Is there a fix for this? <laughs> no. No. There is no, there is no fix. Is no I mean, that's why I say again, all the, all the Hillary haters... People yep. like Cornell West, yep. who said, "Oh, there's no difference," and I'm uh, and Hillary Clinton is evil impersonated, incarnate, yep. and therefore, uh, you know, uh, we're going to sit on our hands and let Trump be elected. I, I hope they're happy. I, though, I have is, no respect for people like that. Yep. This is because this is because they left us not with this decision this week, right. but with decades of decisions ahead of us. Yep. <clears throat> yep, that's where we are. Gwendolyn asks, uh, can states, this is another one, uh, kind of the First Amendment that you were talking about earlier, but uh, can states keep women from crossing state lines? So you were talking about advertising across state lines. What about uh, women traveling from right, state lines? Gwendolyn there's... says that she's from Mississippi. Yes. Uh, so this impacts Gwendolyn a big deal. Yeah, that's right. I, th I think Mississippi is already considering this, such a statute if they haven't already enacted it, saying it, it'll be a crime in, uh, if a woman from Mississippi travels to another state for purposes of abortion. That runs into the Interstate Commerce Clause, uh, which uh, in the federal constitution, which normally says the right, it, no state can interfere with the right to travel across state lines. But I don't underestimate Clarence Thomas's ability to yeah. find his way around any precedent that he doesn't like. Um, that Virginia statute that I mentioned saying you, you can't advertise in Virginia that, that New York allows abortions. I think Clarence Thomas would say, yeah, yeah, man, let's go for it. And so, I, I, I mean, it's anybody's guess what he will say about a Mississippi statute or any other state statute that says it's a crime to leave our state to seek an abortion elsewhere. I, under current law, such a, such a law would be struck down. But when those five justices, yeah. you know, J John Roberts, the, the chief justice, has lost control of those five right-wing justices who are more conservative than he is. He can't control them anymore. And they, I, I, <laughs> who knows? Yeah. Uh, this is more magical thinking, but I am trying to grasp at straws here, Charlie. I've seen I've seen some memes about starry decisis. I hadn't. I is that how you say the phrase? Yes, that's right. Yeah, and uh, how when these justices were being interviewed, that they affirmed starry decisis and. Uh, they were like abortion, Roe versus Wade has been decided on. And uh, I think one of them, uh, Barrett, uh, said, uh, but that doesn't mean that it can't be changed. But the rest of them during their interviews were like, uh, yeah, uh, this is precedent and something to the effect that we're not going to change it. Can we can can we uh, can we uh, kick them out? Is that possible? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it goes back to what I just said about the, the, the number of people. It, it would take the number of senators. It would take a two-thirds vote of the Senate to impeach uh, any member, any justice of the Supreme Court. And uh, if that happens, I'll give you my ranch. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. Right? Right. You know, that's just magical yeah. thinking. They're not yeah. going to be impeached. They are there for life. Uh, and most of them, well, I think really all of them, Adam, weaseled enough in their statements that okay. they could not be said to have outright lied. Dissembled? Yes. Shaded the truth? Yes. Told a white lie? Yes. Told a half-truth? Yes. But commit perjury? Uh, that's a high bar, and I doubt that uh, they could be uh, convicted of that. The idea, they all did mention precedent, of course. That's the phrase, stare decisis. That's a Latin phrase. It just means stand by your decisions. Mm -hmm. If that decision came down 10 years ago, by golly, we've got to, we're going to follow it, unless there's a good reason not to. And so Samuel Alito last week spends the first 20 pages of opinion saying, yes, we all believe in stare decisis, except mm -hmm. when the earlier decision was transparently wrong. I mean, I forget the number of adjectives he uses to describe Roe v. Wade, you know, transparently wrong, disastrous, uh, without foundation, blah, blah, blah. So, and the fact is that hardly a term of the Supreme Court goes by when they don't overrule some prior decision. So it's not at all uncommon for uh, liberal courts or conservative courts to overrule earlier decisions. I, I I've gotten the Oregon Supreme Court to overrule its prior decisions in a couple of cases. So uh, it happens. Now, uh, Gwendolyn's got another question. I read that plan B can no longer be ordered on Amazon and shipped to my state. Is that legal? Again, from Mississippi. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that, that's that same interstate commerce question. Can yep. a state regulate that? You know, it, it, what is the law right now regarding... Um, Fireworks, you know, fireworks are illegal in Oregon, but people drive across the interstate bridge into Vancouver and bring fireworks back all the time. I, I don't know if that's, is that a crime to cross a state line with bringing a substance that is illegal in the state? Uh, how about firearms, you know, uh, guns? Uh, certainly the states have various degrees of regulation of guns, although most regulations will be out the window, again, thanks to uh, Clarence Thomas. Um, but, you know, you, you cannot, one state cannot unduly burden interstate commerce. You can't, you can, you can put a tax on liquor that comes in from out of state, uh, and out of state producers of wine may not like the fact that Oregon taxes their wine, but those, those things the court has upheld. But you can't, block the importation of, of, of most substances. And I, I think any, any, any effort to block the sale of contraceptives from another state or plan B morning after pills, uh, I think, well, again, under present law, those things are, are, are allowed and, and protected. What Clarence Thomas will do to them if he gets his hands on it, God only knows. Um, Amber is asking you to get in the head of Clarence Thomas. <laughs> um, not that I want you to do that, Charlie, but uh, she is asking about the birth control and contraception decision and asks, why? Why would they want to ban contraception? Uh, well, uh, you know, getting in the head of Clarence Thomas is really an important issue, frankly, because you 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 wonder how did he get to this point in his life uh, he is i mean hillary clinton is absolutely right he's a man of resentment and anger and he always has been from the days that he was at yale law school he always blamed yale law school for being an affirmative action baby as he put it because he he was admitted to yale law school in the early 1970s when yale was making a, a concerted effort to get more black students in. Now, I'm not suggesting, and I don't think Yale believed that he was unqualified to sure. get in, but, you know, 10 years earlier, he might not have, because there would have been more qualified white people, perhaps, or Asian people or whatnot. 
But at the time Clarence Thomas was admitted to Yale Law School, he, he, there were 34 uh, black students. They were at that time mostly called African-American students in, in, in Yale Law School. And one of the sources of his resentment was that when, in, when that class graduated, 32 out of the 34 black law students got jobs with uh, Wall Street law firms or the equivalent uh, high-powered, high-toned uh, corporate law firms. Clarence is one of the two who, who didn't. Mm. But the reason was not that it had anything to do with his race. It had to do with his attitude. Mm. And the 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 size of his afro and the and and the clothing that he wore. He wore bib overalls, and mm. there's nothing wrong with having an afro that's a foot right. high or bib all overalls. But if a white person with an afro like that and wearing bib overalls interviewed at a Wall Street law firm, they wouldn't have gotten a job either. You mm. know, I mean, you you <laughs> you're aiming at a clientele and Wall Street banks at that time weren't just weren't prepared. But anyway, he always resented the fact that he believed that he was in in there in Yale and he didn't belong. And mm. so for 40 years afterwards, he refused to go back to Yale. He finally went back when they when they unveiled a portrait of him, but he made one visit for one afternoon and that was it. So yeah, and and Samuel Alito is a similar situation, not a black man, obviously, but a person from a minority group, a Roman Catholic Italian son of immigrants uh, or grandson of immigrants who felt aggrieved about how he and his people had been treated. The, other, the three Trump appointees are a different story, but the one thing ha they have in common is that all five of them had very strict Roman Catholic parochial upbringings. And they carry that with them to this day. Mm -hmm. Amy Barrett is a member of one of the most extremely yeah. right-wing conservative Roman Catholic uh, sects. And, uh, you know, she, and these people have no, and this is where we get over into the next topic. Mm -hmm. These people have no compunction about promoting their faith through their through their uh, uh, court uh, decisions, they haven't they haven't rejected a single claim of religious liberty yet. And um, again, that's Katie bar the door. The the wall of separation between church and state is going to be non-existent uh, uh, within a, a very sh short time. Oh my God, uh, Luke uh, says in overturning Roe that virtually eradicates all right to privacy. Is that does that seem true? Well, what the majority said is that Roe had no constitutional foundation. It's not mentioned in the Constitution. The right of privacy is not mentioned there. And all of its uh, of the uh, of Roe v. Wade of the efforts of the Roe v. Wade court to create, to find, to discover a right of privacy, it's all a house of cards. That's mm -hmm. essentially what they said. And how they can then refrain from applying that same analysis to the right to ban contraceptives, or the right to ban gay marriage, or the right to ban uh, sodomy. I I think those I think it's almost inevitable that those decisions will be uh, will be overruled. Only the hand of God through a fortuitous death. Right, uh, Dina. Dina uh, says something that might also be magical thinking, but this is another uh, way that people have suggested we could solve this by expanding the court. Uh, the court, as I'm sure everyone on here knows, because you study this, you follow it. Uh, the, in our in the 19th century, the court's membership, the number of justices changed. I think it was like nine different times. Mm -hmm. uh, it started with five. It went to seven. It went to, at one point to eleven, I think, and then it and then it went back down to nine. But it but that is purely statutory, and it can be changed. Students of American history, though, especially modern students, still bear the burden of remembering what Franklin Roosevelt tried to do, uh, because in the early in his first term in office, the very conservative U.S. Supreme Court struck down almost every one of his major 
statutory initiatives uh, uh, as part of the New Deal. They held them unconstitutional on one ground or another. So Roosevelt sent a bill to Congress to expand the court. And it was, had, I've forgotten now exactly the formula, but it was if, it, if any judge reaches the age of 75 or 80, uh, we will add another judge. So it wasn't going to take any justice off the court. That would have been unconstitutional. But we're going to gradually expand the court so that there, so that I, <laughs> President Roosevelt, will, will have a majority. Well, that was greeted with an overwhelming, not just a yawn by Congress, but active opposition, especially and most uh, pointedly by his the Democratic leader of the of the U.S. Senate. Um, so Roosevelt was so badly burned, and then he lost the midterm elections that year uh, in 1938. Uh, it was a Republican a wave. And so the idea that if even FDR could get burned by proposing to expand the court means it's not likely anybody else is going to uh, succeed in doing that. And, you know, it, that would be that if, if somebody were to introduce that bill now, that bill would be subject to a filibuster. Yeah. And there's more than enough Republican senators to to block any legislation they don't like by filibustering it. Yep, yep. Um, Allison, uh, I spoke with Allison on the show uh, about a month ago when the uh, the document was leaked. Uh, so go check out Allison's uh, conversation. Allison says, "I'm disappointed that Charlie seems as dejected as I am." <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's tough times. But Allison also says this. Um, maybe you can get a response, uh, Charlie. Didn't Biden say uh, just say he supports getting around the filibuster just for passing an abortion law, not removing it entirely? I'm very disappointed in Biden, but glad he did a 180 today and supports passing a law to enshrine Roe. But that'll just be repealed when the GOP takes control again. I don't want my right to choose to depend on who holds power. Well, I don't think he can even get the filibuster uh, abolished uh, because as, uh, as long as Joe Mans Manchin is in there, I mean, he has said he, he supports the filibuster. He will not vote to uh, overturn it. And so we don't, the Democrats don't have even 50 votes to overturn the filibuster under, under present circumstances. The one straw that we all have to grasp at is that this decision and the foreseeable consequences of it hopefully will motivate to, people to go to the polls this fall. And, you know, everyone has been talking about the Republican wave that's going to take a majority control. Well, maybe, maybe there will be enough people upset enough about the yeah. uh, abortion decision that we will save uh, the Democratic seats that are in jeopardy and take back Pennsylvania. I mean, that's, that's a Republican seat that is now vacant and uh, there's a very strong Democratic candidate. And maybe, you know, maybe we'll come out of the election next fall with 51 Democrats. Even so, it's going to be uh, touch and go to uh, abolish the filibuster for, for uh, Roe v. Wade. And I really wonder, even if they did abolish it, uh, it would would every Democrat be on board to establish right. a, a federal right to abortion? Uh, I don't. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe <clears throat> it's hard to know. Uh, Gwen, Gwendolyn says, and this is we've done this in the history in the United States. This, uh, and then we'll move on to uh, religion in the public square. But Gwendolyn says we are going to have to go underground and take care of each other with whatever it takes, and that's. Uh, you know, I can remember underground uh, abortion clinics uh, in the history of the United States working this through. So, Wendelin, we may need to, to go in that direction. Well, but, absolutely. Uh, I, I'm taking out my notes here about this because I do want to mention that uh, the Northwest Abortion Access Fund, Northwest Abortion Access Fund, Just Google it. You'll find their website. They're based in Eugene. And they've already gotten a million dollars from the state to help their activities. It's a private organization, but it, it's it's so well. Its primary purpose, at the moment anyway, is to help women from other states come to Oregon to get an abortion. I mean, if if uh, if Ruth Barnett could perform forty thousand abortions in the nineteen twenties and thirties and forties when it was illegal in Oregon, there will be at least that many. I mean, I know what happened when I was in high school. 
you went to a certain parking lot of a certain restaurant on 82nd Avenue uh, after midnight, and you met a man who brought another man who, who knew a man, and uh, you paid a little money, and you got an abortion. That's how uh, it will be that... in the years ahead in Mississippi. <clears throat> yeah, I'm going to put that link here in the chat uh, for anybody interested. The link's there now. Uh, the other big Supreme Court decision that's been in the news uh, just uh, happened uh, north of us here in Oregon, in Washington, uh, with a coach who was praying after football games, I think, on the 50-yard line and having uh, students come and he would lead them in prayer and some kind of a, a speech. And this, uh, he was being sued by the school district um, for uh, prayer in the public square or prayer in the public schools. And the Supreme Court uh, decided that he had a First Amendment right to uh, do those prayers. Uh, and so can you tell us a little bit about uh, about that, the history of that, and uh, where where we might be going in the future with with that case. Well, it is a strange phenomenon among uh, people of a certain faith that they want to impose their insert their religion into the public sphere in every way that they can, not because it helps their relationship with their God, but because they want to impose their beliefs on other people and solicit other people to share in their beliefs. That football coach, for example, it started with, uh, I think you said, Adam, uh, getting the whole team together for prayers. Uh, the, the school board put a stop to that. And so he got around it by simply saying, well, all right, I'm not gonna invite anybody to do it. I'm just gonna go out there on the 50 yard line after the game and kneel down and pray myself. But everyone will know what I'm doing and I, I will make, a, I will set a good example. Um, and it, it is amazing that people like that have never paid much attention to what Jesus said in, in the Sermon on the Mount when, when he called people like that hypocrites. Hypocrites who stand on the street corner or stand up in the middle of the synagogue and pray as loud as they can so that everyone can see that they are a religious being who believes in prayer. Mm. Jesus said, it's much better to go into your own room and shut the door for God's sake and mm -hmm. pray there behind a closed door. Uh, that that those two verses, Matthew 6, 5 and 6, I think it is, must not appear in the Bibles of, of, of these of these people because they, they certainly pay no attention to it. There is absolutely no reason that that coach could not go back to the locker room, could not go out to his car, couldn't just walk away praying. But no, it has to be a vocal public prayer. And that's the, that was the basis on which the U.S. Supreme Court years ago said that we will, we will not tolerate vocal public prayer in public schools in the classroom because that gives the appearance that the school board has endorsed the prayer, that the teacher has endorsed it, that you are an outsider if you don't believe uh, in, in that prayer. And we're, we want to avoid the appearance of entangling the secular government, whether it's the school board or the city council or anything else, in, into religious practices. Because the school board and the city council are there to serve all of us, believers and non-believers, uh, Christians and Jews and Muslims and Wiccans and God knows what else. Uh, and they should be there. Uh, they should feel free to exercise their rights as students, or as members of the public in the, before the city council without any reflection on their religious beliefs. The Supreme Court has been pretty, pretty strict in enforcing that. And they upheld maybe 20, 20 25 years ago now, uh, the rule against pr public prayer at a high school graduation. Hmm. That was one of my great victories under the Oregon Constitution. Uh, it, it is still unconstitutional under Oregon to have prayer in the public schools at public school graduation. And that's still the, the law of the, whole, of the whole land. But not until Clarence Thomas and, and Alito and the three other right-wing Roman Catholics get their hands on it. Those, 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 statute, those court decisions are in very dire jeopardy as well. And we know that because the court has now in the last few years decided several decisions relating to public subsidies for religious schools. Um, 
it used to be a pretty strict rule that you couldn't you couldn't use public money, public taxpayer money, to support a religious institution. Well, the Roman Catholic Church, primarily the Roman Catholic Church, and I, I mean, there's just no way of getting around that. Other, other religious organizations too, but the Roman Catholic Church has for decades looked for ways to get public assistance for its parochial schools. And they have tried one scheme after another. The two major ones in Oregon were, um, uh, the Eugene School District gave uh, uh, textbooks, loaned textbooks to the uh, parochial schools. And the Oregon Supreme Court in the early 60s said, no, you can't do that under the state constitution because the state Oregon's constitution says no money from the treasury can be spent for the support of any religious institution. And the Oregon Supreme Court said quite sensibly that if you're giving uh, public school textbooks to the Roman Catholic school, you are certainly supporting a religious institution. That case was followed a few years later by an Oregon Court of Appeals decision uh, involving the North Clackamas School District, which, which declared that four classrooms in, at St. John the Baptist Catholic Church in, in Milwaukee are hereby public school classrooms, and we're going to send a public school teacher over there to teach math and science and algebra and, and, and whatnot, secular subjects. But just by coincidence, they're going to be doing that in, in St. John the Baptist Catholic School, and they're going to be teaching Catholic students. And the Oregon Court of Appeals said, no, uh, we're, not, we're not falling for that little uh, charade. Yeah. So, uh, or charade is your preference, maybe. Um, and so those, those two laws, those two court decisions are still on the books. We have a very strong separation of church and state in Oregon, but the U.S. Supreme Court has said, and again said it just a few, a few weeks ago, that if the state is giving pu public money to a to private schools, by golly, they have to give it to every private school, even mm -hmm. if it's a religious one. So that may be an opening here for St. John's Catholic Church to try again. You know, to get the Oregon legislature to pass a law saying, well, we're going to give this to all private schools in Oregon. It only it happens, just so happens that there may be only one secular private school in Oregon, but 99 parochial schools, uh, they're now going to get this money. I, I don't think that it will happen. But again, as I said a moment ago, the, the wall of separation of church and state, which has always been a little bit wobbly, mm -hmm. is now uh, teetering on its last legs. These people want, you know, it's always puzzled me. They have a belief in a God who seems to hear, hear prayers only if they are orally, verbally uttered out loud. A public school student can't pray silently at his desk. God doesn't hear that prayer. <clears throat> Got to say it out loud. I, it's, a, it's a puzzling view of God that they believe. It, and of course they don't believe it because their goal is not to pray to God. Their goal is to have everybody else listen to their prayers and be influenced by them. If somebody wants to pray, pray at a public high school graduation, more power to them. Let them pray all night long. But if they want to get up there on the podium and pray, it's because they want the audience to hear their prayers, not God. Yes, and you know that's true because Dina says, and it's the Christian God, right? Oh, yeah, oh absolutely. It, it absolutely. feels to me like there's a that the right wing Christians are wanting a theocracy. They don't want oh, it to me. They don't want democracy anymore. They're moving away from it and moving towards a theocracy. Uh, Dina says, wait till a Muslim or a Satanist tries to pray in these, in these schools, in these public places, right? That they're not going to let that happen. Yeah. I'd like to see what happened. If, if, the, if that uh, football coach took his little uh, prayer shawl and prayer rug and and bowed to Allah at the uh, during halftime, or if one of his students comes in and says, "I'm yes. going to pray to Satan, and I want all of you to come and be with me as I pray to Satan," how that's going to go? Thank you for that, Dina. Um, there are some uh, comments in here uh, about. Um, Fears like I'm saying that they want a theocracy, uh, not a democracy. Uh, where is this going to end? 
Uh, are we at the start of a cold civil war? Um, where are we going with all of these big issues uh, in our culture? Um, it's kind of, it's scary to think about. Um, well, you do hear people talk all the time about the, how this is a Christian nation founded on Christian principles. And we, we're, we're just reaffirming that. That's why it was, I think it was the Eagles, the, the uh, fraternal organization in the 1950s, right? When, when the movie with Charlton Heston came out, The Ten Commandments, yep. the Eagles offered to put up Ten Commandments monumal, monuments in every public squ square in the whole country. And they put up hundreds of them. Uh, and that's why you find Ten Commandments monuments in uh, Podunk, Idaho. And uh, I don't know how many there are in Oregon, not too many. I, in fact, I don't know that I've ever seen one. But in the rest of the country, they are, uh, they are a dime a dozen. And it's thanks to the Eagles. And those have been challenged. But sometimes they have been, if they have been made the focal point, the focus of, of a park, the, the courts have tended to say nothing doing. But if they're there in among other other symbols of other faiths or other symbols of other kinds of things, then, then maybe they're all okay. It's sort of like what goes on in, uh, in Pioneer Square in downtown Portland. Uh, Oregon's, um, what are they called? Oregon's Public Square, Oregon's Living Room or whatever. Can, can you allow religious uh, observances there? And the answer is yes, as long as all religious observances are, are are allowed there. You cannot just say it's okay for the Christians to, to have one. Um, we, we, I say, uh, the ACLU had to challenge the city a few years ago on that. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I, I think the, the city of Portland has been pretty good in, in, um, in this area. We sued, we sued the city twice, Wells against Ivancy. When Frank Ivancy was mayor of Portland, he wanted to start uh, city council meetings with a prayer. And the Multnomah County Circuit Court said, no, you cannot do that under the Oregon Constitution. That's still the law in, in Portland. Yeah. yeah. Say more about uh, the, the uh, founders uh, and being Christian. I've heard they uh, were more deist uh, than, than what we think of today as Christian. And also, like, how does how does the First Amendment and the no establishment of religion uh, clause fit in all of this? Well, the no establishment of religion clause came out of came out of historical circumstances because the early colonies all did have an established religion. You know, when the when the uh, uh, when the pilgrim uh, pilgrims came, they and the and the Puritans followed them and they established the, the uh, colony of Massachusetts, it was in the, it was in the, the Massachusetts Constitution that uh, uh, a, a public subsidy uh, for the Congregational Church, it, it was in the Constitution of Massachusetts until I think 1833, so many years after the country actually got founded. And in Virginia, it was the Church of England. In Maryland, it was the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, they, these would get public subsidies. And so the framers, people who wrote the First Amendment, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. They knew what they were talking about because the colonies had laws respecting an establishment of religion. And the framers said, nothing doing. We're now going to be one country with, with freedom of religion for everybody. And we cannot expect, we don't want taxpayers to be subsidizing uh, uh, religious mm -hmm. activities. And in the states that came along after that, including Oregon, they made it, most of them made it quite explicit in their own state constitutions. I, I quoted, I think I quoted a while ago, Oregon's constitution, no money shall be drawn from the public treasury for the benefit of any religious institution. And you can argue what does it mean to say an establishment of religion, but you can't argue with the phrase no money mm. to <laughs> any religious institution. I mean, that's about as clear as the English language can get. Mm. So, and, and at the same time, the Oregon Constitution said, and every, every person shall have freedom of worship and freedom of belief. 
So the framers of the Oregon Constitution saw no conflict whatever between freedom of religion on the one hand and a prohibition on establishment of religion on the other. In fact, they're two sides of the same coin. Because if you bar, if you prohibit the state from establishing a religion, you are supporting freedom of religion because you're saying everybody in their beliefs is equal to everybody else. And the state cannot judge one over the other, cannot make a particular belief um, a criterion for getting any kind of state subsidy, for example. Um, so uh, Oregon so far has has avoided the kind of religious conflicts that, that has characterized so many states back east, where the Roman Catholic Church has never tired of trying to get its hands into the public treasury. Mm -hmm. well, what about this uh, view of the uh, founding fathers uh, being Christian or being deist, like Thomas oh, Jefferson? We know that Thomas Jefferson. Right. I mean, uh, uh, right. uh, John Adams said quite specifically, we are not a Christian nation and we were never intended to be a Christian nation. And you can find quotations from many of the, of the founding fathers uh, to that same effect. Uh, I don't think they can cite a single member of the Constitutional Convention who, who said, we want, we, want to have a, we want to have a government that establishes religion. I mean, they were, they were rebelling against the Church of England, after all. They were rebelling against King George and the established religion of, of his day, which is still the established religion in, in uh, the United Kingdom. You know, the, the government still subsidizes of the Church of England and the framers of the of the U.S. Constitution said, said no, we're not. We're, we've rebelled against that, and we have some colonies that are this religion and some colonies that are that religion. And there are. We all remember what happened to Roger Williams mm -hmm. when he was forced out of uh, Massachusetts and he had to go to uh, found, found, create a new colony called Rhode Island in order to have the Baptist religion freedom to uh, practice that religion. I, we don't want that. We don't want that religious strife. Nobody can wave a magic wand and eliminate magic strife. And there were Bible riots in Philadelphia up and through the 1840s. Uh, which Bible are we going to read in the public schools? The Catholics wanted their Bible. The Protestants wanted their Bible. There were literally riots in the streets of Philadelphia. And I think people were killed over, over which, which Bible should be read and then and the or framers of the Oregon Constitution were reacting against that too. Wow. Uh, we want absolute neutrality. We don't we want to get away from this religious strife. And and I think that was the the predominant, if not the universal opinion of the framers of the US Constitution too. They didn't make the language explicit enough for Clarence Thomas apparently. Wow. Um, and it's too bad they didn't say more expressly no money no public funds shall ever go to support a, a religious denomination. No. Instead, they said no establishment of religion. Well, Clarence Thomas might say, well, all that meant was we're not going to have do what Massachusetts did and have a public subsidy for a particular church. But short of that, anything goes. If people want to put a cross in the middle of the Pioneer Square, more power to them. I mean, I really think that's his view. And if we got, and if the proper case gets back up in front of him, that will be the result. Um, Candy says we've just got about a couple minutes left, uh, but this is a this is kind of a good one to end on. Candy says, any help with verbiage in discussing these topics with evangelical family? I feel like we have believe in two different Jesuses. And Charlie, you and I have had similar conversations. Uh, it feels like we have two different Jesuses, two different Bibles, uh, even. And um, I, I would love to hear any thoughts you have about that, Charlie, because I, I, you know, I have this struggle too that Candy has. So it's a tough I, one. I think it, would, it it is hard, isn't it, to find anything in the New Testament that supports an establishment of religion. I mean, I don't think. Jesus, uh, certainly Jesus never said anything. By golly, my, my goal in life is to have the Roman Empire establish Judaism or, right. or, yeah. or establish a uh, religion. In fact, he, you know, he, he didn't pay much attention to what the state, what the government was doing. He went about doing good. He went about serving people. He went about 
pastoring people, ministering to people. And uh, that's what we are all called to do and to minister and, and call to every one of our brothers and sisters, our siblings, um, without regard to their belief. And if, if, it can, if the state can establish my religion today, then it can establish someone else's religion tomorrow. Uh, and if, if the state is going to subsidize or allow this religious activity in the public square, then, then it's got to allow and tolerate and promote and approve of someone else's religious establishment uh, tomorrow. The, one of those cases involving Ruth Barnett, the 40,000 abortion person, in one of the Oregon Supreme Court cases, the court said quite specifically, you know, there is a range of opinion among religious groups as to the propriety of religion, uh, of abortion. And they hit the nail on the head. And they, they said that 60 years ago. Well, and there is an equal breadth, a variety of religion, uh, among, a variety of views about abortion and about all these other issues among religious denominations today, even within Christian denominations, let alone um, Muslim and Judaism and Buddhism and all the, uh, all the other varieties of religious experience. We are a nation of variety uh, and a nation of immigrants, uh, except for indigenous peoples. Yeah. And we, we most of us rejoice in that and are grateful for that and are products of that, for that matter. Um, none of us white folk are natives here. Right, right. And uh, none of our religions are native here. They were all imported. You are reminding me of articles that I have seen on social media from my Jewish friends who say that it is part of their religion. Uh, to be able to have an abortion yeah. when it is needed. Is there any way, this is maybe magical thinking again, is there any way that we could do a, like, uh, abortion is sometimes necessary? My oh, religion. absolutely. Yes. Like, absolutely. This is a First Amendment practice of your religion to yes. get an abortion yes. in certain circumstances, including maybe even a woman or uh, somebody who is pregnant, uh, their mental health. This is this is what our religion uh, tells us to do. Is yes. it could, that that could be an argument for somebody having an abortion? Is a First Amendment practice of religion clause? Yes, it, it, and it's not just a peripheral uh, religious belief. It is a central commandment of, uh, of of at least some branches of Judaism that you must you must act to save the woman's life in those circumstances. Yeah, you know, I mean, there's such an inherent inconsistency with uh, the anti-abortionist arguments on on these points. I, I mean, they're all over the map on this. But if if their central view is you must preserve the life of the fetus no matter what, well, then that doesn't that mean that you must pre preserve the embryo as well, and that you must ban abortion from the very moment of conception, and you cannot act. Uh, you cannot make exceptions for rape or incest because after all, the baby in the womb is just as innocent regardless of who his or her father is. And, if, and so if, you're, if the sanctity of that entity in the womb, whether it be embryo or whatever, if the sanctity of that entity is your paramount uh, criterion, then don't you have to say abortion must be illegal, must be a crime in every circumstance? And yet few of, the, few of them are willing to go that far. Yeah, yeah. Raylene says a rabbi and is suing Florida for violations of religious freedom because of anti-abortion laws. So um, good. Hey, thank you. Thank you for that, Raylene. It's good, good to know that. And Charlie, we're getting a whole lot of comments thanking you for this conversation. So thank you for being here, Charlie, and enlightening us on so many of these aspects. It's been incredibly helpful. So thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, thank you, everybody, for your comments, uh, your questions. Thank you for uh, thank you for being here. We're going to do this again next week. At uh, we have a special time at twelve o'clock Pacific. 
I'm going to be interviewing one of my witch friends. So we're going to talk about uh, witchcraft and uh, get her path on becoming a witch. Uh, and so I invite you to join us for that. I was interviewed by her uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago on her podcast. So I'll share that uh, with you. I had a great time with her. It'll be a fun, another fun discussion. Uh, so friends, you can keep up with one question with Pastor Adam. Uh, wherever you listen to your podcasts, you can also watch us on the Clackamas United Church of Christ Facebook page and the uh, Pastor Adam Facebook page uh, every Thursday at around 11, sometimes 12, whenever. So <laughs> anyway, friends, thank you so much for being here. And uh, Charlie, thank you again for being here. Everybody, we will uh, see you again next week. Until then, God be with you.